Hello everyone, my name is O'Leary. On our last iteration, we talked briefly about how attention and sensation-seeking could manifest creatures into the public eye. Whenever you may have people in power act or talk a certain way, many will follow by example. However, this will not be the focus today. Instead, we are going to talk about a belief which was necessary for the stability of the people. This type of monster is possibly the most common in any part of the world. These are the folklore tales spread from ear to ear every passing generation. Irrational beings created to scare people into behaving a certain way, with a punishment ranging from minor lashings to unspeakable torment, or just plain death for the ones who ran out of ideas by the end of the story. I mean no disrespect, however. I'll acknowledge their usefulness where it may have been required in the past. For every fantastic story, there is a kernel of truth behind it all. But I am getting a little off track. Let's talk about the Wendigo. From my experience, I tend to see Wendigo stories posted a lot on YouTube taken from a 4chan storyboard. After a bit of brainstorming, it sort of makes sense. The most popular monsters have a tendency to take a humanoid shape, and Wendigos, in a way, were Slenderman before Slenderman even existed, untainted by saturation. We could go into a lot of depth in how this works, but I'll essentially summarize it. A monster with a humanoid shape is uncanny, especially the more that body is twisted and perverted into a horrific shape, but not quite enough where it is no longer unrecognizable. We are drawn to something similar to us, yet it is created with malicious intent. Wendigos happen to fit this pretty well. The body is stretched to grotesque lengths, making it look tall and borderline skeletal in most descriptions. Just looking at the creature's form can tell a lot about what it thinks and does. It looks like a starving abomination. Wendigos have an insatiable hunger for human flesh, yet no matter how much the creature could access, it will always grow in proportion to its meal. There is however a bit of debate for the head. Some more grounded iterations would simply leave the head human with sharp long teeth and beady eyes. Others however have an animal head, specifically a prey animal. The most common is that of an elk or deer. Some form of kill that may be common to hunt in northern tribes of America. Thinking logically for a moment, this doesn't sound like a sustainable creature. All the nutrients that will be used to fill the body are being put into growth. This thing should just keel over and die, if not from starvation, from its inability to move eventually. One could argue the bare minimum is absorbed, but this doesn't make the monster any less unhealthy for its own good. If this creature did exist, it would be without a doubt cursed to allow the Wendigo to stay alive at all, for anyone's sake, including its own. This is where I will therefore spit in the face of the idea that this thing ever being an actual creature. An animal evolved to suffer like this is simply cruel. There is no depth in allowing a monster to be like this. Wendigos aren't primarily physical beings. They are much closer to demons or evil spirits, which would inhabit a person. This, however, has been overlooked due to popular culture, more focused on the physical rather than the spiritual. Imagine for a moment a small village. The village has workers, farmers, hunters, and sometimes traders who have access to resources outside the land. Every society falls on hard times, 
either due to weather, family feuds, someone vital dies such as the traitor or respected leader, or even a scarcity of game in the region. In this more tight-knit part of the world, the individual was much more important than one would be in a city where one could disappear into the crowd. If you didn't do your part and bring a deer home, for example, then starvation was a high likelihood. Even more egregious was those who actively do not do their part and instead feed off the work of others. When the starvation kicks in, so does survival, and who would be more likely to not share what little is left and leave the rest to die. Greed, selfishness, hunger. There's no mystery why such parasites were shamed as monsters. Only one was plenty capable of devastating consequences. Left unchecked, the days became harder. The hunt becomes less bountiful. The trader no longer able to continue his work. Either forced to leave or hunt as well out of duty or sympathy. Slowly the village dwindles in numbers previously numerous, now minuscule. You are practically alone. With nothing left to take, perhaps this monster would finally leave. But instead, he simply turns to you. And without the skills to hunt for himself or find somewhere else to go, you are left with a monster who doesn't respect you. Someone who would never hunt for you. It's only a step forward where you appear less of a fellow villager, but more of something to hunt. This is the true Wendigo. It isn't necessarily a big powerful monster that preys on human flesh, but more a personification of the evils that could befall the village. It is essentially a living archetype that can take over and completely change man. For those who may not have put two and two together yet, when survival is a top priority, friends and family could completely change from what they once appeared to be. Self-preservation is a deeply ingrained instinct that when manifest will not fit into the norms of a functioning society. The head of the Wendigo is commonly depicted to be animalistic. A suggestion I have is that it separates the beast from men. Those who follow this behavior no longer aspire to any form of human society. They are just animals. Animals that wander the forest, looking for the next thing to consume. <laughs>